Okay, so, uh, so the plan for today is to cover um, two really important topics in deep learning. Um, that, and I'm going to accelerate the pace a bit of the lecture. Um, and accelerate in the sense that I'll be talking about things at the high level. Um, cause, and so I'll, I'll essentially be following the torch model. So once you know how to go and code layers and so on, um, individual layers, individual modules, then you can start talking about um, how would I use a convolutional network to solve another task. So I want to be talking now about at that high level. As assume that you have this module called a convolutional neural network, which you do have. I mean, you just need to Google for it, the code. There's many code demos on how to build a convolutional network in Tor. As I was saying, we're going to start assuming that we do have convolutional networks available as modules, and we'll start using convolutional networks to solve um, different types of tasks. Um, later, I'm going to talk, uh, in the second lecture, I'm going to talk about uh, recurrent neural networks. So there's two essentially big ideas in deep learning. There's convolutional networks and there's recurrent neural networks. Um, if you understand both, then um, in order to come up with all sorts of applications, you just need to know when to use one or the other, um, how to choose their sizes, and how to combine them in, in order to do all sorts of cool uh, novel things. And that's pretty much what researchers do. It's they, they get used to manipulating these objects in, in, in a language like Torch or, um, or some other environment like Cafe. Um, and um, by doing this, they're able to attack all sorts of uh, data problems. Max margin learning. Um, the, the idea of max margin, max margin will be a, a way of um, creating new tasks for learning. And those new tasks will be um, very data uh, rich. The idea of max margin then is, is to create auxiliary tasks that allow you to learn models um, so that you can use those same models in, to solve problems where there's little labeled data. Okay, so there's many problems. So one of the things about deep learning is that they're big models. You require a lot of data to, uh, to train them. But for a lot of problems out there, we have very little data or, or very few labels. Labels are expensive. Supervision is very expensive. And so if you don't have supervision, we need to come up with alternative ways of um, learning the models and learning them in a way so that you can use the same model to solve this new task. That's essentially the sort of idea of general AI, is that you learn to solve some tasks and then you can use the same models to solve uh, other types of tasks. Um, so we often refer to this as transfer learning, multitask learning, and I'll give you a particular uh, case, uh, instance of that called multi-instance learning. Um, there's many auxiliary tasks. I'm going to go over them in detail. Matchings, where the things are similar, preferences, corrupting data. And um, I will then present a way, uh, a mathematical formulation of the, the problem, um, a couple of mathematical formulations of multitask learning. And then we'll pick one that's very popular, um, involving the hinge loss. And then we're going to look at examples that involve um, doing tasks with language in, um, and so in some, in, in some languages there's a lot of data and labels like in English, um, other rare languages there's very few labeled data and so how could we learn uh, how could we take advantage of labels in one language to solve classification problems in another language where there's very few labels um, and, and then we're going to look at other uh, examples like relation learning uh, learning relations between items, um, relations in the terms in, in, in the sense of triplets, like subject um, acts on object, like uh, Jamie likes ice cream, um, so that you could then ask questions like, "What does Jamie like?" and the computer would answer, "Ice cream." Uh, so for question answering systems, that's, that's going to turn out to be very useful. And then I'm going to discuss memory networks, which is sort of one of the hottest um, ideas out there right now, uh, which is also an application of max margin learning. Now, uh, we're going to do a lot of language. So I'm going to just revise something that I went over briefly in the last lecture as to how do you get word embeddings? Um, how do you map words to continuous spaces?
So words are categorical objects, um, like the word cat or dog or person and so on. And the way we're going to represent them is imagine you have a big uh, vocabulary list of all the different words that occur. And that vocabulary list, in fact, will be of size k in my explanation. Um, so that will be the size of the vocabulary list. And if a particular word is mentioned, then you place a 1 in and in the location corresponding to that word. So for each location in a vector of zeros, um, the index of this vector will indicate which word is present. So if we're talking about the word, say, cat, and cat is position three, every time uh, we want to mention the, the word cat is mentioned, we put a one there and zeros elsewhere. <coughs> if you want to encode several words at the same time, like say three words, then you would, uh, three different words, you would have three ones and the rest zeros. So you could encode, in that case, uh, triplets of words. But let's assume that you do a single word. So the first thing is to encode it in, in this one hot, uh, what Fox called the one hot encoding vector. And then if you want to map it to a metric space, um, to a vector, for example, in RD, um, some vector WI in RD, in this case here, there's WIs and R2. Um, so this sort of illustrates how I have, I have several words, and these words are put in a metric space. Um, and in this case, the words are very different tokens, like um, the token for um, August in, I think this is German. Um, in English and German, uh, they, the, the tokens are very different. They use completely different, pr pardon? Oh, I wasn't. <laughs> That's French. Thank you. Louis <laughs> German. Uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> I knew there was German. I, I simply assumed because I got this picture from Carl Herman, who's German, and he was working with German. And <laughs> um, pretty terrible for someone who speaks five languages um, not to recognize French. Um, um, so, um, so the point being that you're mapping these categorical objects to a metric space, and the important thing is that in this metric space, um, things that have similar meaning, one, one, one intuition would be that things that have similar meaning will be close in that space. And things that have different meanings or opposite meanings, you want them to be far apart. Um, that's the idea of encoding. We'll see how we could learn that. So that doesn't just happen magically. We need to essentially learn um, how to do these encodings. That's the idea of actually feature learning. Feature learning is about taking any categorical object, whether it's a logical expression, whether it's a formula, whether it's any symbol, and try to encode it in a continuous space. Um, and then try to encode it in a way that's essentially what we're doing is extracting features. Because once objects live in a space where they're um, spaced out in the space according to relations and so on, um, it becomes very easy to apply transformations, to do classification, to do all sorts of things. Um, so the process of embedding is essentially the process of extracting features. Um, the simplest way to embed, which is usually the first layer on any language model, is to just multiply this vector, that's this k-dimensional vector, by a matrix that is um, d by k. And so effectively what you're doing is you're just picking one of the vectors, uh, d-dimensional vectors. And that's essentially how we've now, if d is equal to 2, this is how we're mapping the word to a two-dimensional space. Um, of course, we don't know these parameters w, and we will learn those with backpropagation. At this stage, all this is is just a linear, um, uh, a linear layer. Though if you implement it this way, it's an expensive linear layer. Um, you could implement it as a lookup table and do something a bit, um, uh, a bit less expensive. Um, now let's take. So that's usually the first layer. We we extract these d-dimensional feature vectors. Um, now, each of these d-dimensional feature vectors, if we now go and do a convolutional neural network, where you have, say, one sentence followed by another sentence, 
um, each of those vectors corresponds to one of these um, one of these uh, columns and so in this case d in this picture d equal four so you have um, for each word you will be learning one of those vectors and then when we do convolutions we essentially move uh, a particular filter say this red filter we move it um, in strides of say one along the sentence and we get the response of multiplying the filter times this input and we place it um, the response um, in this map in this case I'm using two features so two different convolutional filters um, and then one does a pulling operation and for example take max um, the four max elements to reduce the size of the sentence and also to ensure say that all sentences are the same size as you move up in the architecture just to make it simpler and now this here can be thought of as the embedding for a sentence so now if you go to a document you would have sentence one sentence two and so on so you've now taken all the embeddings of the sentences you're grouping them to give you the embedding for the documents and once it's once you have the um, the data placed in this way once again you can think of this as an input and, and perform exactly the same operations of convolution and pooling to eventually get uh, the feature vectors the embeddings for the entire document so in the process of learning embeddings for the document um, and, and here you will have eventually um, this could be an, uh, out, out of here you will get you might want to do some classification and you might you might for example have reviews for uh, movies and what you want to and for those reviews you actually have scores so you, like whether people like the movie or don't like the movie there's, there's plenty of data like that on the web the web is full of opinions and stars and thumbs ups and hearts and all of that um, and so if you have the labels um, you can now back propagate those labels through the network and by back propagating those labels you um, essentially learn all the parameters so you learn the word embeddings you learn the sentence embeddings and you learn the document embeddings so and, and you could take this to character level and there's a recent paper that I uh, think does that um, and you also get those embeddings um, so this is essentially what uh, a convolutional network um, and you can now um, uh, take advantage of having learned um, using data about reviews now learn about uh, individuals in those reviews like individual sentences or individual things being discussed in the reviews so you might have that okay the reviews for this restaurant are great but it just happens that things in the, there are things in the restaurant that are fantastic and there's one thing in the restaurant that is really terrible so there's this waiter who everyone dislikes in the review but the ambience is great the food is fantastic um, you know it's romantic they, they have parking outside they love children dogs or whatever um, uh, but the problem is this waiter and you want to be able to detect that and this is actually a real problem like if you have if you go to websites like Airbnb and so on uh, where reviews are overwhelmingly positive you would like to detect anything that's being said that's negative and you would like to do that automatically um, so that you can you know, uh, uh, provide better service to customers. So one way to do this is um, let's first uh, step one is train your convolutional network which is some convolutional network in Torch um, and you use the labels for say the reviews, say reviews for hotels um, 
And as part of doing this, you will learn sentence embeddings and word embeddings. So my word embeddings are here. I'm just using these green things to denote them. Um, you'll get the sentence embeddings. You get the document embeddings. You get all the parameters. So the idea of transfer is that I could then, suppose I now want to predict how much, how positive a sentence is or how negative a sentence is. Now I don't have, uh, I have data at the review level. I have stars for the review. The entire review is, I guess, three stars or four stars. But I don't have uh, stars assigned to particular sentences. So the question is then, how do I come up with labels for the sentences? Let's put it, let's look at a different application. Suppose um, there's many districts and people vote in these districts uh, for a candidate or for to make a decision about the commu uh, some community and, um, and then you record the scores the, at the district level, so you, you at the neighborhood level. So for each neighborhood you know uh, who they voted for, what the neighborhood voted for. So think of the neighborhoods as reviews, like full reviews with a score. If I have features for the individuals, I could now figure out who, which individual voted for who, or for what. Okay. So essentially this is a, uh, a way of breaking privacy. If you have information at the group level and provide you have good features, you can find information at the individual level. So it's sort of useful for people who think about these type of uh, issues. Um, so we could reuse, we could copy exactly the, the sentence embeddings and the word embeddings, but what we don't have is the output classifier, the softmax classifier. And so that's the only thing that we're going to have to be ingenious about coming up with. Um, in multi-instance learning, um, you can come up with an objective function that looks like this. There's many ways of doing this. This is probably one of the simplest. Um, the first thing you, is you construct a similarity measure where the axes are the sentence embeddings. So think of the output of this part of the network as an XI, as a sentence embedding. Um, now, for that sentence embedding, what we want to do is we want to compute that prediction. So this has parameters theta, and we want to compute the prediction y of XI comma theta. We want to decide whether a sentence is positive or not positive whether an individual voted for a new bridge or for the demolition of the bridge or something like that. Um, so we have the information, uh, the input xi, um, but we don't have the label. However, we can do the following thing. We can construct a similarity metric, and then we construct a cost function that says that if two individuals are similar, if two sentences are similar, they must have the same label. Okay, so this cost function basically, um, this is between zero and one. So if x i is equal to x j, you have e to the zero, which is one. So they're very similar. If they're very far apart, infinitely apart, um, this will give you zero. Um, if I put a minus here, apologies for the type. Um, so, so by having um, a similarity uh, between xi and xj, um, the only way I can make this cost go down is when xi is equal to uh, xj is by making y of xi be equal to y of xj. Now this still has a problem um, because I could also make both y's go to zero, in which case I would get rid of the cost. So we need to introduce a regularizer. And one p possible regularizer is if you have the score for, uh, the in for the review, you can force that the average score of all the sentences give you the score of the review. Um, now, this part or this part by themselves are not very useful. This is no different than when we do uh, regression.
when we do when we fit kernels to data when we're doing the nonlinear regression the regularizer said make the parameters zero which by itself doesn't make any sense because you don't want to set the parameters equal to zero the the likelihood term also didn't make much sense because by itself what you would do is you would just go over each of the points with very weakly curves so you would overfit but when you combine the two um, and choose this with cross-validation, you can come up with reasonable answers. Um, and, and so the, the key point here, so you could have done this in many ways, but the key point is that by learning embeddings in one task, you can reuse them to solve new tasks. Um, now that people have learned how to train convolutional neural networks in very large image databases, you don't have to train these networks every time you need to use them. Um, especially because you would need a lot of resources to do to do that. But you can just take an already trained convolutional network which already has good features and you can use it to solve new tasks. So you only need to worry about the output classifier. All you ever have to worry about is this guy here, the last layer. So reuse what's already been learning, learned. Um, here's an example of what it does with a review. It picks the positive sentences. Uh, it's able to pick the negative sentences and so on. Um, importantly, if you are trying to summarize and you only pick the first sentence, you might end up with the wrong uh, sentiment for the entire review. Because in, uh, in this case, the first one is positive, but then the rest is negative. So, um, Another way of constructing data uh, for an auxiliary task is by uh, finding things that either match or don't match. So um, here's a, a specific example. Suppose you wanted to construct um, um, a classifier that will take images and say who is in the image. Um, well, so for that you would, like for a particular person, you would need um, a lot of data uh, if you want to do face recognition. Um, and so this is actually really expensive. So you could go this way, and it would turn out to be very expensive. Um, a simpler way is if you have video of people, um, you can make the assumption that um, if someone is in a successive video frame, so if, if, if two people appear centered, just one person is at the middle of a video frame in two subsequent video frames, in all likelihood, they're the same person, unless there was like a severe cut going from one news present to another one. But, but you know, by in in all likelihood, it will be the same person. You know, we don't watch video of faces switching. Usually, you have a face there for a, quite a while, and then it might switch, and so on. Most of the time, it's the same person, and you could detect how when things change automatically. And so that kind of data is available. We have plenty of that data. Um, you also can assume, uh, except for some Facebook apps, I guess, that most often if two people appear in the same uh, photo, they're probably not the same person. Um, and so that would also give you the other type of data, the negative data, which says this person does not match this person. And so by using that, you now have a binary classification task, and you can train this. You can come up with a convolutional net, the yellow thing. And then once you've trained that, you just plug it in here, and you just use a few labels um, and train this green uh, guy. You train the classifier. So the idea is you train on a task for which there's abundant labels, and then you reuse the features and train a classifier in tasks where there's few um, labels. Um, and this sort of thing where things match and don't match, um, there's lots of data like this. Um, think of back again at translation. We know what's uh, when uh, there's plenty of data saying that whether a sentence in French matches a sentence in English. So we can use that to learn really good embeddings. And then once you have a convolution model for language, for sentences, then you can sort of construct a classifier very easily that predicts whether um, uh, some, for example, some tweet is positive or negative. And you can do that for rare languages for which there weren't labels. So the idea is you exploit 
um, you exploit that there exist paired data and that you have labels for one language to be able to predict labels for the second language. Another strategy to construct auxiliary tasks is to corrupt data. So um, you could do something like what's being done here, uh, which is you take a sentence and you change a word. So you corrupt the sentence by creating an, uh, uh, n uh, an English sentence that doesn't make sense. Um, so now you know that that sentence is not right. And you also know which one is the right sentence. And so now what you need to uh, ensure is that the right sentence has a higher score than the, sen than the wrong sentence. So you need to say that one should be preferred to the other. Um, and that's again a binary classification problem. If A is preferred to B, you assign label one, if, and otherwise label zero. Uh, so we're going to see how to do this in a bit more detail soon. Um, and the folks who've done this in this paper called NLP Almost from Scratch, um, they were able to pre-train uh, the network using this, and then they were able to solve um, many different language tasks. They can do part of speech, you know, be able to extract whether something is a, a noun or an adjective, it's all automatically, even a sentence. Um, they can do named entity resolution. They can predict whether something being mentioned, whether it's a person or whether it's a location. Um, I mean, the point is they do all these language tasks, and um, whereas previously, every time you, someone tries to solve a task, they will invent their own model and write their own papers and so on. Um, these guys were advocating um, you can do all these tasks with the same model, provided you have you learn the right features. Um, and again, as I mentioned, preference is a way of providing data, and especially um, think of click-throughs. And so when you when you go and do image search, you might click on an image that's the second image in the list. At that point, you're giving uh, information to Bing or Google that that second image is a better answer for that query than the first one. And that gets used. Okay. So the first formulation that we will look at is a probabilistic formulation. So, so what we're after, basically, is how do we come up with a way of saying that similar things should be put together, uh, should embed to... Uh, should have similar features, and a different thing should have different features. Just essentially what we're after. A tiling of that metric space, so that then it becomes really easy to construct a classifier because the signal is there doing the right thing. Um, so if we use probabilities, we can in general always write a probability as e to some energy function, or energy or error or loss, um, and then there's this normalizing constant that requires some summing over the numerator to ensure that the probability adds up to one. This is the problem. Um, the, the, these integrals are intractable for most inference problems. So working with probabilities turns out to be very hard. Um, this would be essentially if we wanted to do maximum likelihood in the setting, um, and for many models, this quantity here, the normalization constant, depends on theta. So the gradient also involves an integral, and it's just very intractable. I'm not even going to go that route. Um, in some of my previous courses, I've sort of derived the gradient and shown that an integral is still there and that that's really bad. Um, but I'm just going to ask you to take that leap of faith and believe that that's true. Um, so let's go rather straight to what folks actually do now in practice. Uh, max margin. So it's very hard to come up with this integral. Um, we could then relax the problem and just say, well, I want a problem that has a low uh, L2 uh, norm for the parameters, so like rate regression. So we have a regularizer. But we want to enforce that the probability assigned to data points is higher than the probability anywhere in the space. So Think of it this way. Suppose let's, suppose I have some data over here. 
and I'm gonna copy it again. What I would like to do is I would like to make this distribution higher where there is data and lower everywhere else. So as to end up with something that maybe looks like this. So this would be the process of learning then is to take you from a distribution where there are other x's that have higher probability than the actual data to a situation where the data is the most probable thing. That's essentially shaping um, the distribution so that it models the data. So, um, to do this, um, I, uh, I s I'm still, I still have to deal with probabilities, but equivalently, I can move away, I can stop working with probabilities and simple, simply work with energies. Because X only appears in the energies and not in the normalization constants. So if I were to take the negative log of this, um, and I compare one with X, one side with Xn, the other side with X, the, the logs of the Zs would cancel and I would just be looking at the differences in energies. So in effect, all I need to um, guarantee is that the energy of the data is better than the energy of any other point by at least a margin of M. Um, now, in any other point, if I'm in a continuous space, I have to say that any other point should be a point that's away from the data by a certain uh, interval. This is still problematic um, in the sense that I need to, uh, if you think about it, the constraint here is that uh, for all points x, for an infinite number of points x, uh, I want to make sure that the energy of the data is better than for all those points. But essentially I'm creating an optimization problem where there's an infinite number of constraints. A way of relaxing this is by, um, instead of taking every possible x, only take the most offending x. So we pick the x that minimizes the energy, Okay, so that's the biggest rival, the, the, the guy that's the lowest besides the data. And then I, I only need to make sure that the energy of the data is better than the best of the remaining axes. Okay, so I only need to do better than, the, the data has to be there and then x star has to be the second best. So you can think of now iterate, having an algorithm that iterates between computing theta star, computing x star, theta star, and x star. Um, just like we did for rich regression, instead of writing a problem as uh, minimize um, parameters subject to a constraint, um, it's possible to rewrite it um, as a single um, equation without constraints, where you put the objective and, and the regularizer um, as, as two things that have to be attained, and then we introduce a trade-off parameter called lambda. Now, this is still saying the same thing. We want the energy to do better by a certain... Um, uh, we want the energy of the data to be lower than uh, the second alternative by a certain margin. And this function here that I'm introducing here, the max between zero um, and this guy, it's called the, the hinge loss. So we've learned about the quadratic error before. Uh, we've learned about the um, uh, softmax and cross entropy losses. And this is another of the, one of the most popular criterion used there to measure quality um, is the hinge loss. The hinge loss essentially, um, if you have um, the quadratic loss The quadratic loss will look like something like this. So if this is x, this is x squared, 
Um, the hinge loss, you have a margin M, and then you pay linearly. So in this case, after minus M, the hinge loss increases is zero, and then it becomes increases linearly when this is e to the x n theta minus e x star theta. Um, the reason why we like this type of loss function instead of quadratic losses has to do with a question that someone asked me uh, in the beginning of the course, which is how to prevent vertical lines. Um, if, you, if you use quadratic loss and you have an outlier, suppose that the true mean is here, if you have an outlier, you pay a huge cost because this is increasing quadratically. Um, but if you if you use the hinge loss, any value within here has zero cost. And once you have outliers that go off, you pay only um, a linear cost. So when we were doing linear regression, where we had lots of points, instead of using a Gaussian like this, if you believe that your data has outliers, um, it's, um, you should be using uh, the hinge loss. So this is probability, but if I, if I were to do, this is kind of mixing two things. My loss, instead of being a loss that looks like this, should be a loss that looks like this. And then if I have a point that's off, an outlier, I don't pay a huge cost. In the quadratic case, a single point would make the line tilt, but the hinge loss would uh, prevent that to some extent. So you incur no cost, zero, um, up to minus m. Um, so you give yourself this margin. And after that, you start paying a cost. Um, now, that still turns out to be very expensive. Because it still requires that you find the best of the second. And so that's another NP-hard optimization problem. Um, what folks end up doing in practice is they introduce samples. So you sample some corrupted data. Um, so for ex you've, we've seen some, one example is you pick a sentence and you corrupt it um, by uh, changing the order of the sentences or by introducing some random word into the sentence. And so now what you need to optimize, essentially this is the energy, the score of say a correct <coughs> sentence. So this would be the correct sentence. So you take a sentence, you put it through the convolutional network, and this is the output, the E of xn comma theta. And you can think of this as the energy, as the loss, as the output. You can think of it as also a score. This will be the score for a correct sentence. And this will be uh, the score for uh, an incorrect sentence, sentence with incorrect uh, syntax. And all you're saying with, the law, with this loss is you want uh, correct sentences to have a higher score um, than incorrect sentences. Okay, And that at least by a margin um, um, ME in this case. By a positive margin. And th this is essentially the hinge loss is what we use everywhere. So for, to solve all those problems I mentioned in the beginning, it's just uh, applications of the hinge loss. In torch, um, the hinge loss happens to be the, lo the, the loss that you uh, put here on top of the neural network. And what that loss, um, that loss takes two inputs, x1 and x2, uh, the two guys that you're comparing. And all you need to do then is take the derivative with respect to the input to have the two messages. So the message forward is just evaluation of this. The message backward is just a derivative of that max. And in this case, you do need to compute two derivatives. Uh, with respect to x2, you'll have plus 1. And with respect to, so the derivative will be plus 1. And with respect to this one, it will be minus 1. And that's essentially what I've written here. Um, and I introduce this signal, this i, which is either 2 or 1, to simplify, to include both cases. Um, 
But that's essentially um, max margin in one in one um, um, in one equation. So I kind of tried to take you through a bit of a route of approaches that folks have tried before. Um, but it, uh, at the end of the day, if you have a mechanism of corrupting the data, which you might not always have, it's it's very tricky to come up with corruptions of data sometimes. But if you have a good way of uh, uh, indicating uh, corrupting the data, then you can always try to come up with this loss, which assigns higher weight to corrupt data. That basically says um, that you want lower energy for the correct uh, uh, sentence. Now, um, here is an example of this. It's the where you take a sentence, um, and let's say now that it's French, and one in German. And what we do is, you apply a ConvNet, we'll assume we know how to do this, and for the German sentence, we compute the embeddings, uh, function G, and we compute the embeddings for um, the, the French sentence, a function H. And so what we want is that the two sentences are saying the same thing. We want uh, the embeddings to be the same. Um, so we want basically them to have the same features. That sort of picture I showed in the beginning where the, the months, whether they were in French, the names of the months, whether they were in French or uh, German, they were in the, uh, the similar points in the metric space. So we want these vectors to be close, to feed them to have the similar meaning, basically. Um, but we also want to introduce a margin because we want to make sure that if they are not the same, they should be far away from each other by at least a margin of m. Okay, so we want them close, but we also, uh, but if you introduce, um, um, so this will ensure that they, if there's if if the G and B will be similar to each other, if the inputs are similar, they'll be uh, similar. But if we introduce, um, I forgot to mention here, a corruption, okay. so we don't use the correct translation, but some other uh, centers in the other language, you want this one to be uh, preferred, um, this option to be preferred to the second option. So it has to uh, have lower energy. Um, a similar idea to this, when you can't corrupt the data, is to use uh, similarity. So when you use similarity, um, if um, what you can, you can essentially say the same thing. Um, if H are the embeddings, and this is called Siamese networks, because you can think of, you know, just you have two networks uh, where you're feeding in two different types of data, but they're um, identical networks so that you want them to do the sa have the same embedding. Um, so essentially you're requ requiring that network one, um, networks that are for which that are similar, so if you know that xi is similar to xj, indicated by this function s, um, then you want to minimize, you want them to be close to each other in the embedding space. And if they are different, you want to move them far apart by at least the margin mh. Um, so this is the same thing, and in fact you can map, you could use the same approach um, to do the centers embedding, so you could do a little manipulation that will take from one approach to the other. From an input, from a designer perspective, uh, you would do this when you have similarities. Um, if you have uh, ways of corrupting data, then you use the other approach. Um, so Jason Weston and colleagues at Facebook um, have also used this to uh, train when you only have labels for a small set of the data and you have a lot more data without labels. And so they only, um, so here they use the negative log likelihood where they have labeled data. And where they have no labels, they simply use this principle that if two uh, things are similar, for example, if two video frames are one after the other, they should probably embed to the same latent space. And they actually did something like that for video. Um, there's many other ways of doing this. Oh, um, 
you might have similarity um, by having paraphrased uh, data sets. There's a few of these out there, and Phil Blossom here works with some of those. Um, you might also have something like um, embeddings. Um, you might have questions that people ask, and for those questions you might uh, be able to uh, have database queries. So for example, um, Freebase has a, a big database, has all sorts of entities of the form, again, subject, object, uh, and relation, um, like Peter likes ice cream. Um, and so if you have a question in, um, in natural language, like what does Peter like, um, you can transform that to a query and then that uh, into the database. Um, and so the way to do, uh, the way folks do this is by embedding the query in the query language and embedding the, the question and making sure that these, they have the same embeddings. And by doing this, you actually, all you need to know is that this query matches this question um, or this piece of code uh, matches this question and you embed them to, to the same space so that when you um, so that when you then try a question, you basically evaluate the embeddings, and then from the embeddings, you try to generate the query. This part of how to generate the query, that's, that will be the second lecture today. Um, folks do this using these, uh, here's another example, like black cat eats white mouse. Um, and folks try to use uh, networks that take as input also um, the embeddings for the three words in the relation. Um, and evaluate the output energy of the neural network. And um, like Yosho Benjo has this really nice example where he wants to learn a joint embedding for the triplet so that um, he's able to, from the triplet, ask questions like um, what is part of a car, as he mentions here, or who is Obama married to, and so on. And again, in order to learn, he considers uh, corruptions. And he considers corruptions of the subject, corruptions of the object, and corruptions of the, of the relation. And of course, you have to have lower energy for the correct data than for the corrupted data. Um, at training time, um, you do this again with uh, online SGD, as we've uh, uh, seen before. You pick a correct sentence, you then um, corrupt it in one of three possible corrupting mechanisms to produce an X tilde, and then you simply minimize this loss, which says that the energy of the corrupted um, uh, data should be higher than the true date. And that's pretty much uh, it. And if he does that, he can then ask questions like uh, army attacks and then his model predicts uh, these um, outputs, which are all very reasonable. Or you can also ask, given the output, um, at the right-hand side, earn money, and then you ask who earns money. Uh, business firms earn money, people uh, earn money, and so on. Um, my final example of max margin is uh, memory nets. So the idea of having memory is that if you have some input and you can put it in short term, so you might be reading a story and you want to store some of the facts about the story, um, you might process some of the facts and send them back into the, some short memory. So think of this as like your cortex. And think of this as some sh facts that you're just putting into working memory. Um, and then when someone asks you a question, you then answer that question. Um, now, there's a nice t biological story about this. Um, if if short-term memory is your hippocampus, and by any chance someone cuts your hippocampus, and this has happened in the past, before we knew better, um, then you will not be able to form new memories. But you will be able to recall all your old memories, because they will be coming from your cortex but the hippocampus will not be able to consolidate uh, new memories. So it's like you will remember all your past, but every time you meet someone new, and that person leaves the room and comes back into the room, you will not remember that person. 
So anything new that happens, you can't remember. Um, and so patients like these have been uh, very much studied in neuroscience. Uh, I mean, they're, they're like they provide, um, I think, some of the most compelling um, information about how we could design intelligent machines. In fact. Um, so I think this topic is extremely important. People who have also got impaired hippocampus can also not make, uh, have also trouble planning. So from that we can think that this is important because when this goes away. Um, during sleep, the hippocampus talks to the cortex and that's when we sleep, that's, that's when our brain actually is, works the most um, and it's consolidating memories. And, and you can do this because you can prime subjects at night by presenting them lists of words. And then the next morning you ask them to recall uh, the list of words. And because of associations, they will come up. So one example a neuroscientist ran by me recently is you might prime the subject by presenting the words uh, heart and uh, 16. And the next morning you ask them to repeat the two words. They, a lot of them will say sweet 16 because they just it wouldn't happen during the day, but um, during a sleep time, you consolidate memories. So if you actually want to make sure you sleep, it's very important. Um, okay, so memory networks um, is this like super hot paper that came out of Facebook. And there's two papers that came out and they hit the press and so on. They were like, we're going to look at this, the, 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 the Google one um, in the next lecture. But um, first, we look, let's look at the Facebook one. Um, the idea is you, you have some input, and you create some feature representation from the input. But then you want to add that input to a memory, Okay, so some sort of working memory. Um, and then once you have memory and inputs, you want to produce outputs output features. And then once you have output features, you can think of um, slapping that last stage, which is the classifier, to predict something. So you might have features out of a ConvNet, and then you have an output classifier that converts that output into words or sentences and so on. We're going to see a lot of examples of that in the next lecture. Um, uh, the, the way it's implemented by these folks at present is um, the memory that they use is just a slot memory. So essentially, they just take input sentences and they just put them in basically in a database. And that's your memory. And they just put one after the other. Um, in order to, um, and you can, in order to now um, predict an output, um, they will use a neural network. And they like to use S instead of E because they like to talk about scores. And I think in this case, it actually makes more sense to talk about scores. And so score basically will take the input and will find the memory that is most helpful toward producing an answer. Okay? And once you have the most helpful memory, you look for the second most helpful memory. And you could do this by picking. So you're basically going into your memory. So you have some input, someone asks you something, and then you're going into your memory to find facts that will help you with your answer. And once you have pulled all these facts, then you do one last thing, which is to generate the answer. Each of these scoring functions could be just any sort of, they use some sort of uh, embedding and a dot product, could be any type of neural network um, that we've discussed so far. Um, how do they train this? Max margin. The same idea. Um, so they, this is their margin. Um, and then in this case, they actually have labels for the sentences that are, um, so they create data sets where they know which are good sentences that would uh, help, that would provide evidence for you to answer a question. And then they also know which are bad sentences. So they put uh, good sentences here and bad sentences here. And then just try to make good sentences uh, have m higher score, or equivalently have good sentences have lower energy than bad sentences. Um, 
and then they do the same thing for the second sentence and they repeat the same thing again for the, for the output of the system uh, the answer in this case and here's an example and this is actually what the, the network does um, so, so here um, there's a story Joe went uh, to the garden then Fred picked up the milk Joe moved to the bathroom and Fred dropped the milk and then Dan moved to the living room um, so it's a bit of a contrived story but it makes it easy to answer um, this, this type of simple story makes it easy for these networks to work well um, then you can ask a question what is Dan? Uh, the network answers living room I believe where is Joe? the bathroom and then the story can continue. Fred moved to the bedroom, and Joe went to the kitchen. Blah 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 blah. And you, you know, you get you get the idea. You keep asking questions, and the network is able to answer uh, because it's building this sort of memory of all these facts of what's going on in the story. So, uh, it, and it's able to look at forever. It look at in this memory for evidence to be able to answer um, the um, whatever question you ask of it. So, um, yeah, super cool. I think. Um, that you can build this um, and to do this all you need is the max margin criterion the hinge loss which is one layer in torch which has already been coded for you so if you can implement a convnet in torch and you can slap a hinge layer on top of this which is just used a hinge layer cri error criterion then you're done then you can actually go and uh, code this yourselves the hardest bit will be for you to generate this data and do the experiments and so on. Um, and, and that, like especially as you do the practicals, if you find this like overwhelming to just get the data in a format and all this, um, um, you know, don't be overwhelmed. It is truly overwhelming. Um, but, you know, these folks, they don't spend one day and come up with an answer. Usually there's teams of people in this case, extremely smart people like I know Jason and Antoine, um, and they spend a good deal of time in order to come up with one of these models. So I'm kind of not making justice to it by just going over it quickly. Um, in this course, you're being asked to learn all this in eight weeks, um, and you only have seven practicals. Um, so don't, don't be disheartened if you not able to, don't feel like you could go and implement this right now, it would take some time, but I am confident all of you would be able to, hopefully we've given you enough tools that with a month of your own time, you can go and implement memory networks. Sorry, I have a question. Does this sort of network record the sequence of memory event like, can you ask a question, where did Joe go? So yes, I, uh, one detail I haven't put in here is time. But the time is um, in, in the max margin criterion. So in their paper, if you Google memory networks, you'll get this uh, as the top hit. Um, they do introduce uh, time constraints for facts. And it's also done via the hinge loss, I believe, if my memory doesn't fail. But yeah, time is important. It's a good, very good observation. Okay, so um, the next lecture we'll do recurrent networks and we'll look at what uh, Google's uh, version of this is. Five minutes.